Hi everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be cramming quite a lot into the next 45 minutes, so get yourself a cup of tea and get ready for a whirlwind tour of all things sustainable seafood. We'll be talking to renowned chef and writer Tom Hunt about how he's built his whole business around eating more sustainably. We'll also be joined by Dr. Bryce Stewart, marine biologist and ocean optimist, who'll be sharing some insights into his and others' research into sustainable seafood. For those of you that don't know me, my name's Jack Clark, and I'm the sustainable seafood advocate here at the Marine Conservation Society. I lead on business engagement when it comes to seafood, so if you ever need any advice on business planning or seafood sourcing, do please get in touch. I will share my contact details at the end of this webinar. It's been a busy couple of years for us here. Uh, we've been rebuilding and rebranding the Good Fish Guide. And while all the information and the ratings are still the same, I think you'll agree it looks a lot more appealing. We've also spent the past 18 months talking to contacts across the seafood world, from wholesalers to caterers, fish and chip shops to fine dining spots. We've been focusing on how we can work better with businesses. And on the back of these discussions, we've got some exciting programmes coming in 2022. But today, we'd like to introduce you to the first step on this journey, the Good Fish Guide for Business, which I'll be demonstrating later. But first, I'd like to talk about what modern consumers are expecting from businesses in terms of sustainable seafood and how you can take steps to meet these expectations. Now, I'm sure a lot of you watched Sea Spiracy. It was a very busy couple of weeks for us here at the Marine Conservation Society. And so what you like about the film itself, it certainly brought the issues of overfishing and the sustainability of seafood to a new audience. Now, it was nothing new for us. It's why we get out of bed in the mornings, but it was clearly new to a lot of people. And rather than take the message of there's no such thing as sustainable seafood as gospel, British consumers wanted to know more. Traffic to the Good Fish Guide increased by two thirds and there's been a 255% increase in searches for the term most sustainable fish over the past 12 months. It's clear that consumers care more than ever about the impact of their seafood choices. And it's a trend that's here to stay. So hopefully you can see the presentation in front of you. I just wanted to share with you first an eye-opening figure about UK seafood consumption. 80% of the seafood that we consume in the UK is made up of just five different species, cod, haddock, salmon, tuna, and prawns. Now, not only is that really boring, it's also pretty unsustainable. We're an island nation and have so many diverse, interesting and delicious seafood options caught right on our doorstep, but three quarters of our seafood is, is exported overseas. Concentrating the seafood market like this puts a lot of pressure on a handful of species. This drives unsustainable fishing and farming practices to meet our demand. We want UK consumers to diversify their seafood intake and help make seafood consumption more sustainable overall. As a business, you can play a massive part in this by introducing consumers to new species on your menus. Not only is this a great idea for the environment, it supports local producers and it makes your menu more memorable. We know people are less likely to experiment at home with something that they've never eaten before. In our YouGov survey, which I'll cover more in a moment, 39% of people who buy seafood said that familiarity was an important consideration when in the supermarket. But as a chef, you have the power to show your customers new and exciting flavours, all whilst telling a great story. Sustainable seafood shouldn't be seen as a box ticking exercise, but a culinary adventure. Now, let's take a look at our research. Along with the rebrand of the Good Fish Guide over the past 18 months, we've been looking into what consumers are looking for and who's eating seafood. YouGov 
on behalf of the Marine Conservation Society, carried out a survey to discover more about consumer attitudes on sustainable seafood. Three quarters of UK adults think that unsustainable seafood has a large impact on the health of our seas. That's huge. People are caring more than ever about our natural world and thinking through their food choices more carefully. We discovered that 43% of people who buy seafood think that sustainability is an important consideration. And that doesn't just mean in a supermarket, but also eating at your restaurant or purchasing from your business too. And we found that 24% of UK adults who don't buy sustainable seafood feel that the process is just too complicated. They don't know what to look for. We know it's not straightforward for consumers or businesses, and that's exactly why we're here today. We want to make it easier for everyone to make the right decisions. People want to do good. We found that 77% of seafood consumers try to buy sustainable seafood at least some of the time, but they find it difficult to understand how to do it. 87% want better information so that they can be confident that they're not buying unsustainable fish or seafood products. Now, we do a lot of work in Westminster. We were even at COP26 last week, but we can only do so much from the top down. The big change is going to come from businesses choosing sustainable options and shouting about it to their customers. More demand for sustainable seafood leads to more sustainable fisheries and farms. Your action drives the supply chain forward towards sustainable seafood options, and it drives down the demand for overfish species, giving them a chance to recover. So let's take a look at who's eating seafood in the UK. Most seafood is eaten by the over 50s. They haven't traditionally been too interested in sustainability, but the over 50s are now 53% less likely to be eating out and millennials are stepping into the breach and millennials care. They expect brands and businesses to ensure their su supply chains are sustainable. In a 2018 poll by Nielsen, 85% of millennials said that it is extremely or very important that companies implement programs to improve the environment. This isn't a one-way interaction though. 90% of them are willing to pay more for products that contain sustainable ingredients. That's a huge majority, and this is the future. Millennials are placing responsibility with businesses and as we know, younger people eat out more often. This really does place the onus on hospitality to promote their sustainability credentials to prospective diners. So I think you'll agree, it's clear that there's a huge call for businesses to ensure that they're sourcing sustainable seafood and that they need to showcase this to their consumers and customers. We know that people want to put their trust in brands and businesses, but we also know it can be confusing. We know that some businesses are trying to make changes. Perhaps you've even thought about cutting down the seafood options on your menu or just sticking to one species that you personally believe or you've been told is sustainable just to make things easier. Recent press and films like Seaspiracy have left a lot of people questioning whether it's actually possible to take fish from the sea sustainably. But we wanted to provide you with an answer to this and share how fishing can be done well. We want to arm you with knowledge. So we've invited Dr. Bryce Stewart, marine ecologist and fisheries biologist at the University of York to show you how fishing sustainably can be achieved and that all is not lost. Welcome, Bryce. Hi, everyone. So my name is Bryce Stewart. I'm from the Environment and Geography Department at the University of York. And hopefully I'm going to inject a little bit of ocean optimism into your day and look at this question. Is there really hope for the oceans? So I think if you have any interest in fish uh, and seafood, you would have to have been maybe living on the moon or hiding under a rock not to have heard about this recent film, Sea Spiracy. And in particular, it was very confronting about the state of the world's oceans and came out with statements like, if current fishing trends continue, 
we will see virtually empty oceans by 2048, and that there is no such thing as a sustainable fishery. So as a result of these views, the, the filmmaker actually recommended at the end that we should all stop eating seafood. So what's the reality here? Because I, for one, certainly don't want to give up eating seafood. I love it. So yes, it is very true that the world's fish stocks are in a somewhat troubling state. We know that approximately a third of fish stocks are overexploited at the moment, and that figure has been rising over the past few decades. And we also know that pretty much the rest of them are, are fully exploited, so they're at maximum sustainable yield. So there's not really any room for expansion of those fisheries. We also know that it hasn't just affected the overall number of fish, but in a lot of cases, the largest and the most reproductively active um, individuals from those fish stocks have been lost through to fishing mostly, um, and, uh, and also the largest species, particularly things like sharks, for example, that are especially vulnerable, have been especially depleted. And of course, it's not just the effect of fishing itself on the target species, we also have a situation with high levels of bycatch, habitat disturbance from scallop dredging and, and uh, bottom trawling and things like that as well is also causing loss of biodiversity and loss of ecosystem function. And all together, this is disrupting food webs and in some cases, you know, leading to adverse outcomes such as toxic algal blooms and things like this, which again then have a direct effect on human well-being. So not only do we have the effects of fishing to deal with, but of course, we're dealing with rising climate change, ocean warming, ocean acidification, and a growing global population. So how can we turn things around from this somewhat perilous state um, and enjoy sustainable seafood into the future? Well, we really need to, because we need, to, uh, we need our fisheries. You know, fish provides over 3 billion people, that's not far short of half of the world's population, with over 20% of their daily protein needs. Fish and fishing is also integral to the, to the history, culture and traditions of many countries and coastal communities. Just think about the UK, fish and chips is the national dish here. There's also a lot of people involved um, in fishing and fisheries, uh, approximately 800 million livelihoods worldwide. And of those numbers, 60 million approximately are directly involved in, in catching fish. Not just commercial fisheries important, but also uh, recreational anglers. So again, the, the, there's a bit of range here, but possibly up to 700 million people uh, are involved in recreational fisheries. They don't have such a large impact on stocks, but they do gain um, a lot of well-being benefits from that, and they also provide a lot of scientific information as well. And then finally, it's worth noting that sustainably produced seafood actually has a lower carbon footprint than most other protein sources. So if we can find a way to manage fisheries sustainably, there's a lot of benefits to be gained. And actually we can, we know how to do this. So this is from a recent study um, published by Hilborn and colleagues, and they found that in the uh, intensely managed fish stocks around the world, which provides about half of the world's catch, that actually abundance is increasing, whereas in contrast, in the other stocks which are not well managed, then abundance is decreasing. So a good example here is in this graph. Uh, this is the combined patterns in the uh, USA and EU fisheries, and if we look at this blue line, which is the, the average abundance of stocks, we can see that through the 70s and 80s, it was generally decreasing at quite an alarming rate. And the yellow line is the harvest rate, how hard we're fishing them. But due to good management, uh, improvements in management, I guess, the, the information of the US Magnus, Magnuson and Stevenson's uh, Act and or the reauthorization of it and the reform of the common fisheries policy, both around the year 2000, either side, saw an arrest in that decline in fish stock abundance and actually an increase in recent years. And that is directly in proportion with decreases in harvest rate. So we know that at a global scale, if we put the effort into managing fisheries, then it does work. 
So just to bring this to light with a specific example from this part of the world, um, I used to work at the Marine Conservation Society from 2005 to seven. And one of the fish that was on our fish to avoid list was North Sea Place. I actually got a, still got a screenshot of the, um, of fish online at the time, you can see it's rated five as a fish to avoid. But since then, it's had a fairly dramatic, uh, almost remarkable recovery. Um, so you can see that in a couple of these graphs here. Uh, what we see, for example, is fishing pressure, which was you know, just ratcheting up through up until the early 2000s. Then due to good management, um, it, was, it was brought right down and in response, in the spawning stock biomass down here, we can see this spectacular recovery. So now North Sea Place is actually listed as a best choice on the MCS fish, uh, uh, fish Online or Good Fish Guide. I'd also just like to talk to you about some research that I'm personally very involved in um, that really gives, gives me hope and hopefully it will give you some hope. So this is up on the Isle of Arran where Scotland's first no-take zone was designated in 2008. It was passed by the Scottish Parliament after years of campaigning by a local community group called Coast, Community of Arran Seabed Trust, which was formed by these two chaps, Howard Wood and Don McNeish. And they brought together the community to lobby the government um, and got this area, this small area, it's only uh, less than three kilometres squared, designated. But uniquely, um, it was designed to benefit both fisheries and conservation. And we've been monitoring the recovery of that area since 2010. On the back of that small area, which is this red zone here, um, a much larger marine protected area was designated in 2014 and then protected in 2016. Now, importantly, this does allow fishing um, different types of fishing. So for example, there's some trawling allowed around the edge in this green zone, and there's, uh, there's grilling or potting for crabs and lobsters in the yellow hashed zone. But there are some areas that are completely protected. These blue areas, for example, protect seagrass um, and merle and things like that. So it's a multi-use area. Now, as I said, we've been monitoring this, and this slide just gives us a summary of some of our results. The key thing is proportions uh, of scallops in the most protected areas have recovered quite spectacularly in the no-take zone about fourfold and actually in that larger MPA about sixfold just in less than four years time of protection. We've also seen dramatic recovery of the seabed in terms of biodiversity, uh, abundance of, of uh, benthic life or seabed living life is about twice what it was. And, and certain species are really doing well. And also lobsters, so lobster abundance in the, in the no-take zone has really uh, increased. And importantly, we're seeing spillover from these protected areas onto the fishing ground. We're seeing breeding from the scallops spreading out into the surrounding area, and the lobsters actually moving from the protected zone into the fished areas as well. So it is doing what it was designed to do. It's benefiting both conservation and fisheries. Now there are lots of MPAs around the UK. Um, it looks quite amazing when you look at them on a map. Uh, over 370 um, covering 38% of our sea area. But unfortunately they're not very, well, not very well managed at the moment. So actually in terms of these highly protected areas or no take zones, um, it's a tiny, tiny amount. Now these don't all have to be no take zones, but we certainly need to improve management of these existing MPAs. And that's something I'll be certainly concentrating on uh, and have been ever since I've been here in the UK for the last 20 years. So I hope that's given you a bit of ocean optimism. Um, I'm just gonna leave you with a few of my own tips. Um, some of these are personal, things that you can do, rethinking your travel, increasing efficiency of your home, generally eating less meat, but seafood, as I said, is a really good choice uh, in terms of your carbon footprint. So choose sustainable seafood, use the Marine Conservation Society Good Fish Guide, uh, look for MSC or Marine Stewardship Council eco-labeled seafood, but also get involved yourself, you know, get involved with things like beach cleans and get involved with the ocean, you know, get out there and enjoy it. And that will motivate you to do your bit. So that's all from me. I'm just going to leave you with this thought from uh, a scallop 
be more scholar and I think the world would be a better place. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Bryce, a fascinating talk. And I hope that's left you all with a little bit of ocean optimism. I'm here today with Tom Hunt, award-winning chef, educator, writer, and environmental activist, uh, who last year published the amazing book, Eating for Pleasure, People and Planet. Some of you may know Tom from his, uh, from his writing in The Guardian. Um, I know him from way back when, when I used to sell his restaurant fish. Um, so thank you so much for coming in today, Tom. Thank you. And fine fish it was too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was, uh, yeah, many moons ago. Um, I thought we kicked today off really um, just by asking you, what does sustainable seafood mean to you? Okay, well, I get asked this question a lot, more kind of generally, what does sustainable food mean to you? And I guess uh, the, the long answer is, is that um, about 10 years ago, when I first started working with Teresa, actually your old business partner, um, I set up a project called The Forgotten Feast, which was really my response to the, the climate crisis and, and food waste and the, the global food waste scandal when we started getting these, cute, these headlines stating that we were wasting a third of all food that we were producing and all these kind of shocking facts. And these events spurred me on to create my own food sustainability philosophy called Root to Fruit Eating. And so, since then, really, I've been working on this kind of manifesto and philosophy to communicate what sustainable food is to people. And Root to Fruit Eating has three key principles. Eat for pleasure, eat whole foods, and eat the best food you can. Now, I feel like approaching these issues with a kind of value-based approach is the best way to do it because really through ruminating over these issues, I realized that we're wasting food and kind of causing all of this catastrophic environmental um, disaster because we've lost touch with the origin of our ingredients and essentially nature. We've, food no longer holds any value. So for me, it's all about kind of reconnecting with nature and our environment and what's more important than kind of that when we're talking about fish and fish sustainability. Um, I mean, I also like to refer to the UN definition of a sustainable diet because it encompasses the, the kind of vast complexity of, of the subject. And um, they, they say that a sustainable diet is one that has a low environmental impact, contributes to a healthy life, present and future generations, is protective and respectful of biodiversity and ecosystems, is culturally acceptable, something that's often forgotten, I think, offers reliable access to affordable and nutritious food and optimizes natural and human resources. Now, all of those, of course, can be applied to um, seafood and, and should be. And so when I'm choosing wild seafood, I'm looking for plentiful species caught using low impact fishing methods, and they should also be fairly traded because we're kind of working within a global food system. It's great to source locally when you can, but a lot of the fish we buy comes from all around the world. Um, but then farm seafood is a slightly different beast, isn't it? I mean, um, I tend to steer towards inland fisheries that have or, or are concerned about the environment so they're not impacting the environment negatively but then also the the fish feed that they're fed should be of course from sustainable food fish stocks because often it you know the the conversion ratio of the fish feed to fish that will be fed to a human is is really not great and it comes from these unsustainable fish stocks so 
that's these are all kind of different factors that we need to consider yeah definitely and i think yeah you raised some you raised some great points there just in the kind of um the lack of variety in a lot of our diets um but especially with seafood where you know 80 percent of the fish we eat in this country is made up of just five species cod haddock salmon tuna and prawns and you know if we want to help out local fishermen and we want to help improve fish stocks here at home um you know we need to diversify what we're eating um put a bit of interest into into things and yet just a bit more of a holistic approach to to choosing our food and um and trying trying new things um and i think yeah a lot of what you preach is is bang on the money with that I th I'm glad you've brought up diversity because, I mean, there's such an incredible diversity of spe fish species out there that, that rarely um, get eaten. And of course, just putting all this demand on these five fish, fish species, just it, it's a recipe for disaster, isn't it? It's just this, it's the same as kind of agriculture. Like if we're not, if we're just kind of living off you know, these three or four key ingredients like soy, wheat, rice, um, and maize, it's just too much pressure on, on that kind of section of the industry. And it's the same when it comes to the oceans, isn't it? Like diversifying supports biodiversity. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, just the impact on the planet of, you know, a few staple crops, um, and just an over-reliance on a few species of seafood, um, it can just drive unsustainable practices. Um, and uh, yeah, it would be nice to see some of the efforts that we're putting in um, to, you know, ensure that Norwegian and Icelandic governments are putting in to ensure their cod socks are sustainable. Um, it would be nice to see some of that transferred onto our own local fish stocks here in the UK and improve the sustainability there and just bring a bit more um, diversity to our own food culture, you know, which, um, you know, can be can be slipping away, some, some would say. Um, but yeah, I thought as a restaurateur, you know, you run a great tapas joint in Bristol, Poco. Um, was it really important to you to, to source sustainably from the outset there? Yeah, it was actually. Um, we set out to to be an exemplary, sustainable restaurant because I was setting up the Forgotten Feast exactly the same time. It's actually our this month is our tenth um, anniversary, so we're yeah we're pretty excited about that. But at the same time as setting up Poco, I was setting up the Forgotten Feast, and the Forgotten Feast really is a social enterprise, and I didn't want to be one of those chefs or that had kind of different values for one operation than another and so we ended up applying kind of the, these kind of social enterprise values onto our restaurant which really pushed us to be as sustainable as possible and you know apart from that it was just kind of dear to my heart it all made sense you know it's really important that that we're supporting um our bioregional homelands and global ecosystems and as uh individual i believe we each have a responsibility but as a business that responsibility is multiplied by the number of mouths we're feeding so you know that could be thousands if not millions and so yes it's great and those individuals if those individuals make a better environmental choice but as a business if we make a better environmental choice the impact is infinitely greater and will benefit the whole food web that we've built around our business which is as you know and as we've already discussed kind of glo global and far-reaching mm. and do you think your kind of your ethics and your model for business has that has that benefited you in a kind of business sense is that is that something you know you deciding to to take that angle 
um, has it been has it been worthwhile? Absolutely. I mean, it brings kudos, authenticity. Communicating it allows your business to practice transparency, which builds trust with your customers, of course. And um, yeah, I mean, there's loads of other ways that it's helped helped us too. I mean, often it's these kind of less popular, well, you know, in, in this case, fish species that can actually be more economical. Um, hake, coley and mackerel are great sustainable options as long as they're fished correctly from the right location and they'll they'll save you money mm. um yeah so i mean and then it's it's important as well to realize that sometimes sustainably sourced food can cost more but um if you're communicating your values properly then i'm sure your customer base will accept either a uh, kind of adjustment in portion size or um or price yeah yeah you would uh, you definitely hope so and yeah you mentioned uh hate coli and mackerel there all all great choices um you've been using the good fish guide for quite some time uh and why do you think it's important that businesses use tools like the good fish guide Um, well, for me, I think it's really important to avoid grey areas when it comes to sourcing sustainably, because there's so much false and misleading information in the food industry. So evidence-based, science-based guides like the Good Fish Guide, which in my opinion, or from, to my knowledge, is the, the most comprehensive and unbiased science-led guide out there, um, it just it allows you to, to, to have confidence in your decisions and know that they've been made in the best interest of the fish and the environment in our oceans. There's some, there's some good guides out there that are kind of owned by uh, fish monger organizations, but you, you know, you can't always necessarily trust them. So for me, I, I like to just kind of avoid those gray areas and kind of go for that science led approach and make sure that I am really kind of performing best practice. Yeah, yeah, sounds great. And I mean, you have chosen to go on a kind of a very kind of proactive mission with your with your business and, you know, with your entire career. Um, what steps do you think people and businesses and chefs uh, can take when they're first starting out down this path? What are the what are the the easiest things for them to implement? Do you think? I think perhaps. Well, the best advice I think I can give is that like you're you're not alone you should be working closely with your fishmonger or fish wholesaler because if they're worthy of your business really they should be kind of working closely with you to improve your sustainability and the good fish guide is a tool basically to do that um so i think i'd suggest kind of writing up uh, a policy i mean we we choose to only serve fish rated one or two by the Good Fish Guide in their traffic light color coded system. So that's fish, the best choice that you could make in terms of its sustainability. And, um, and then we've, we've put in place agreements with our suppliers so they will only supply us that fish. And yeah, we've had a really, actually some of our suppliers uh, are larger and some are smaller and both have really worked closely with us to, on this to improve our sustainability. I mean, our large supplier was basically printing the boat and catch method along with the fish on our invoice, which I, I thought was amazing of them because oh. it just gave me full confidence in, in, in the, well, it, it showed good transparency, didn't it? And, and, 
and authenticity within their service. Yeah, yeah, it's just what you want for a, for a wholesaler. Um, and yeah, it's the kind of thing we always ask businesses and chefs just to start talking to their wholesalers and their suppliers because it's those questions that make them understand that traceability is something that their customers want and that they have to meet those requirements. And it's chefs and businesses and restaurateurs that are driving that change down the supply chain. It's always better to come from businesses rather than us NGOs trying to kind of force them to change their ways. But it makes, yeah, much better business sense, I think. So the Good Fish Guide with its traffic light rating um, is quite a, it's quite a prescriptive tool uh, telling you which certain species from where using which methods um, are best to buy. How um, have you fit that into your kind of quite holistic, broad approach to eating more sustainably? Yeah, well, I mean, that's one thing I love about the Good Fish Guide and the Marine Conservation Society is that it is so prescriptive and so clear. So it gives you the fish zone and everything and the catch method. But sometimes if you haven't got complete transparency from your fish wholesaler, it can be hard to pin down like exactly where your fish has come from or how it was caught. And I would suggest moving to a wholesaler that can provide you with that transparency. Um, but if you can't, then there's certain fish species which are easier to identify with, within the Marine Conservation Society's guide that are best choice, best choice without any um, mixed ratings. So mackerel, for example, Arctic char um, and hake are, are, I think, um, best choice no matter wherever they're from and so I would always steer to those kind of gold standard fish species whenever I can um, but then I'd also look to working with smaller day boats because they're going to be able to provide you with that transparency and also the freshness and quality that you're you're looking for when it comes to serving really good and delicious um, seafood. Brilliant brilliant Okay, thanks so much, Tom. We've covered a lot of ground there. Thanks so much, Jack. Welcome to this afternoon's main event, the Good Fish Guide for Business. Uh, this is a brand new tool that we've been working on for quite some time now, and we've tested out with uh, a lot of businesses of different sizes, and we've really tried to kind of condense it into something that hopefully we'll find you'll find really useful um and it's very simple uh and essentially it's the good fish guide you all know and love this is the main page of the good fish guide um let me move this down here um and all we've done is added a um a login for businesses so once you've signed up and registered which is very simple it's just a quick form uh, you can log into your sustainability profile. Now, this is my sustainability profile. This is our name, the hilariously named Testy McTest uh, from my flourishing seafood business, Testy Fish. Now, this is your main sustainability profile page. Uh, it's got a pie chart of all your, of all your ratings, uh, some guidance and resources. So our sustainable seafood sourcing policy that you can download and edit, um, as well as loads more resources coming in the coming months, all sorts of handy links and, and more info about all things sustainable seafood, and also your seafood source list. So this is a long list of seafood or a short list if you only stock a few things, um, and you can add and remove to it as you see fit. Um, I've been a bit blue peter here and this is one i have prepared earlier um, so we've got a range of species on here from red rated halibut all the way up to best choice hake and these ratings are reflected in this handy pie chart so this pie chart at the top just gives you a really top level 
idea of how your sourcing stacks up. Now, we uh, tend to suggest that businesses should try and source uh, seafood rated one to three. So here we can say, see 80% of the seafood in this list is, is one to three, which is great. 20% fish to avoid, so not so great. We'll need, to, uh, we'll need to fix those. But one thing to remember is this is completely confidential. Uh, we can't see what you're adding to this list. So it's a great place to kind of mess around with, uh, with um, potential sources, draw up lists to compare different sources and see which ones stack up to be the most sustainable. Um, and yes, no one will, no one will know what's, what's going on here. Um, so yes, if we go down to our seafood source list, we've got here an alarm bell. Atlantic halibut, wild Atlantic halibut is a critically endangered animal. So what we need to do is stop selling wild Atlantic halibut. So let's click on Atlantic halibut here and it'll take us to the uh, specific ratings page for this fish. Now, what we can see is it's, is it's red rated. Um, so let's view all of the species, all of the options, all the ratings for this for this species and see if there's anything better that we can find. So we've now gone to the species page, which shows us all the ratings. And unlike the previous Good Fish Guide, now you have this extra button here where we can add to source lists. So what we've got here is a British farm talibut that's Rated one, best choice. So great, let's add that to our source list. And then if we return to our sustainability profiles, and scroll down to our source list, Atlantic Halibut, best choice, excellent. We have cleared up an issue with our sourcing there. Now, what we want to do now is remove the old Atlantic Halibut from this list. Simply done, you just click edit list, remove Atlantic halibut and refresh summary profile and it's gone, super duper. Let's go up to our pie chart, 90% now, we are sucking diesel, but still 10%, we've got to find out that fish to avoid. Where are we? Pacific bluefin tuna. The old bluefin tuna, right? Eh? So let's have a dig around and see what we can do in this case. Clicking on that, taking us to its specific rating page. Uh, now we know that Pacific bluefin is, is not doing too well anywhere. So let's have a scroll down here to alternative sustainable species. So albacore tuna, that might be a good swap. So let's have a look there. And here we are, an MSC certified hook and, hook and line fishery, best choice. Let's put that in. We can also have the option here to remove it from the source list on the, uh, on the ratings card there. Um, so if you do it accidentally or if you're just walking through. Um, back to our sustainability profile. Ninety-one percent. We just need to remove this chap. Edit list. Remove. Refresh. And here we are. Hundred percent of our ratings are three or better. We've nailed it. Um, so you've got this handy list here for comparison. It makes things it makes things easier. It's all on one page. If you've got a very long list, it's it's tabbed, so it'll go over over multiple pages. But you've got all your ratings in one place, which is really useful. It's a great way of drawing up a list if you're looking to uh, improve your sourcing. You can go on there and be like, right, okay, we want to serve Dover Soul, but you know, let's see where we can get our Dover sole from. We can only get it from these fisheries, add them all to your list. And then, you know, it's a, a great thing that you can then send over to suppliers and go, look, we want Dover sole, but only from these places, can you help us? And this is where the next function comes in really handy. You can print or save it as a PDF. Uh, so just by, I'm gonna use the shortcut here, control P. Um, 
and print it out as a PDF, save it as a PDF to your machine. Uh, and you can then share that with your suppliers. Or, you know, if you've um, if you narrow it down to only the species that you're that you're sourcing at your restaurant or at your business, you can print out that list and share it with your front of house staff. So if they get any questions, uh, they've got a handy little reference sheet telling them the name of the species, how it's rated by us, and then location, capture and farming methods, down to certification, all the information there that you need. It is a little one-stop shop sourcing tool that we really hope you will find useful. And one of just many tools that we will be rolling out over the coming months uh, to help businesses choose and use seafood more sustainably. And now I think we've got a few minutes to squeeze in some of your questions. Uh, we've got a question here from Nick Underdown. Are labelling laws in the UK and Scotland adequate to ensure consumers understand the sustainability implications of their buying choices? Well, um, labelling laws in the UK state that for unprocessed seafood products, so that's whether you're buying a whole fish or uh, fillets of fish in a packet of supermarket, it has to show what species it is, where it's been caught and how it's been caught or where it's been farmed and how it's been farmed and whether it's certified or not. So from that information, you can have a look on the Good Fish Guide uh, as a consumer and find out whether you're making a sustainable choice. The information is there, the onus is put on the consumer um, to do the digging though. So, you know, it's, it, you know, we would like uh, consumers to be able to have a, a clear idea um, of whether things are more sustainable or not. But yeah, just sadly at the moment, the onus is quite often put onto the consumer to, to find that out for themselves. Um, although some retailers and uh, businesses do make things much, much easier. Um, and uh, yes, for, you know, processed seafood products, so uh, like a fish pie or something, then those labelling laws are slightly different. So, you know, we would like to see that uh, those laws copied over to cover processed products. That would be really handy. Uh, we've also seen more recently that with a lot of online retailers, um, online kind of specialist fish suppliers supplying uh, UK kind of households, uh, their sourcing details are quite vague. And we've spoken to a few of them and it's because they tend to ha hold quite wide array of stock. Um, but we would like to see some movement on that as well, because it's quite hard for people to get um, a solid a solid rating on the Good Fish Guide from the information that they're that they're providing. Uh, where are we? Bernadette has said, "How positively do you think choice editing by supermarkets contributes to the availability of sustainable seafood to consumers?" Uh, well, Bernadette, uh, choice editing. Uh, I guess you mean. Uh, limiting the range of seafood available for people to buy. Uh, well, you know, the people want what the people get, I, I guess. Uh, and, you know, it's it's marrying our kind of very fine uh, array of seafood that's available. You know, as we said earlier, 80% of the seafood we eat is made up of just five species. Um, and supermarkets have, you know, probably played a role in reducing the the range of seafood available uh, due mainly to the scale at which they operate. Um, but also in more, more recent years, quite often due to the fact that they have quite stringent guidelines on the sustainability of their products. So, you know, if they want sustainable sources of things like cod, there's only a certain number of fisheries that can provide that. So. You know, until the UK government improves the sustainability and data around, you know, smaller local British stocks, um, then sadly, you know, for supermarkets trying to source sustainable seafood, 
uh, consistently throughout the year, we're going to see um, a kind of an edited array of, of what's available. That's not to say that, you know, there aren't great sustainable sources of, of seafood available at more specialist suppliers, at, at fishmongs and things like that. Um, but uh, yes, I think if you want a wide array of seafood, um, the, the supermarket is probably not the best place uh, to go looking for it. Um, although I'd say in recent years, they have made great strides in at least improving the sustainability of the produce, uh, which is great to see. Uh, Dave in Dorset has asked, can I trust businesses when they say responsibly sourced? Uh, uh, well, it depends on the business. Re it, this, this normally refers to um, a code of conduct that uh, is voluntary and uh, different businesses uh, follow the guidelines to different extents. And, you know, it's always best if you suspect that something might not be responsibly sourced or even if you're just interested uh, to independently verify what they're selling you by checking it up on the good fish guide. And, you know, if you're buying seafood, like we said earlier, as long as you find out what species it is, where it's caught or farmed or, and how it's caught or farmed, you'll be able to verify that on the good fish guide. Um, and that is what we would suggest you do. Uh, now, folks, we are running out of time, so I will uh, I will say adieu. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope it's been useful for you. Um, I we will uh, share a screen of uh, my contact details, and we will email you all a link of the recording of this webinar, as well as uh, the link to sign up for the new business, uh, Good Fish Guide for Business. And uh, yes, any questions or um, any comments, do please get in touch. I'd be very happy to help out in any way I can. And yes, any suggestions for what you'd like to see or next steps for our business program, do please let us know. Thank you so much again for joining us and have a great rest of your days. Bye-bye.